Sometimes simple ideas led to ambitious and complex projects. Cairo is a very gray city. People living in Cairo are living under one square meter per capita of greenery in uh, rich areas. So we're talking about in poor areas that one inhabitant has the luxury of less than his footprint of greenery. To work in historic city is always a high risk proposition. In the case of the Arab al Ahmar, there are things that have not worked. People have been used for about 500 years to look out of the windows and see a heap of debris and garbage. The entire area was, was not a safe area. It was a very difficult zone to work in. We had at one point 1,200 workers on the job. It seemed like a mission impossible. Some dwellers were saying we would pray to God before falling asleep that we would wake up and the house will not crash on our head. You can't give up on a dream like this. It's such an enormous uh, project that impacts a lot of people. The idea of building a park in Cairo was brilliant at that time. We had no greenery. So creating this park actually, in my opinion, was like the biggest impact, not just on the area, not just on the neighborhood, on the entire city of Cairo. This area was a barren piece of land, which for about 500 years uh, has been used as a place where unused uh, debris were thrown away. It was um, really a garbage dump. So the idea to build a, a park here may have seemed rather utopian or ridiculous to some of them. Darb al Ahmar historically is a neighborhood that developed following the 12th and the 13th century. And since then, it has been evolving. It has been continuously inhabited by people, by craftsmen, by um, a very, um, let's say, very solid community of local residents of historic Cairo. However, it has been suffering from a lot of like high levels of poverty, deterioration of the physical conditions, and um, lack of investment in infrastructure. So it was deteriorating as an inner city neighborhood. Well, you're looking at an area which used to be uh, a very prominent area in Egypt's history, old history. Um, through the years, it's been through different phases. Uh, one of these phases, actually the most recent phase, was actually some, some area that is um, known for its drug dealing activities. And um, that was cracked down in the mid 80s. Um, and since that, all of a sudden, when this happened, the whole economy of this area kind of dropped down.
When we studied the community, it was a surprise because you find uh, people with modest means and people who are well off living side by side. What they have in common is a lifestyle. They assist each other out of necessity. Uh, there are a lot of elderly because it's an old neighborhood. People have been living here for generations. So the fact that they are living, working, owning, uh, intermarrying, it's such a well-knitted, strong community. A home could be owned by 20 plus owners because it's inherited and the inheritance, you know, enlarges. The rooms inside, they were lacking natural light and ventilation. Or you can find two families or three families sharing a bathroom. Only one out of 100 had a heater, water heater. They all showered with cold water. Not because they were poor. They wouldn't invest in a house that they thought was not worth investing. Most of the inhabitants had no interest to improve the place where they were living because it didn't belong to them. Some of them were squatters, others they didn't have a, a, a lease which could be documented. So to feel secure, they need to have some kind of title to property. Residents of Darb al Ahmar were ashamed to even say that they lived in this area. But the park was just this seed that to be planted in this area that will flourish the entire zone. A seminar organized by the Aga Khan Award for Architecture took place in Cairo in 1984. It gives me great pleasure to pay tribute to His Excellency the Prime Minister and His Excellency the Governor of Cairo for the help and encouragement which both they and their officials have given to the organization of this seminar and to the site visits associated with it. The Cairo seminar was very important. It was on the metropolis of uh, Cairo. We had the seminar at the Marriott Hotel, and then we had field visits. HH met the president, he met the prime minister, and it was on television every day. Everything was very well covered, and HH was very happy with the result and the way he was received. So he said, I want to give something to Cairo, so please go and see the governor. So I went to see, but a month later, I went back to Cairo and saw Jim Abu Talib and said, HH was very happy, and I think you're happy. He wants to donate something to Cairo. So he pondered a bit. He said, look, we are very short of green spaces. How about a garden? I know it's not architecture, but..." What about the garden? I said, well, I can speak to him about the garden, but I'm not sure he'll accept. He said, look, there are three, I'll give you three proposals. There was a small one, which was a square somewhere in the old city. I can't remember the name of the square. About 500 square meters. There's another plot of that, which is about, I can't remember, 1,500. And the third, there's a big rubbish dump on the road to the airport that everyone knows, everyone complains about the dust when there's wind, etc., which is 35 hectares. And that's a bit big. I don't think he'll accept, he said. But go and see him. It's next to the Azhar Mosque. Prime area, he said. Just give him these three. So I went back and told him these are the three proposals, and I suppose the middle one is the one which would... And he said, no, no, no. How far is the rubbish dump from the Azhar? He said, it's just next to it. So then, that's what I want. I was surprised. I went back to Cairo and told the governor. That's what he wants. The governor was surprised too.
then the Americans come up. We're going to build three uh, water reservoirs. You can't do it here, you have to do it elsewhere. I said, but we've already got the authority from the minister. He said, yeah, well, we have the authority from the minister or whatever it is to build these uh, reservoirs. And then we had to negotiate for two years. The construction of three major water reservoirs to provide water supply to this area of Cairo was one major factor that delayed for more than 10 years the construction of the park. That was an extra challenge that added to the complexity of building the park, that we had to integrate these water tanks into the, the uh, landscape and the hardscape of uh, the project. It was frustrating because the park had been in the news so many times, but in reality, there was no construction taking place. But there's a flip side to this. There was a benefit that the design was able to mature over time. And when we began construction, the design was all set in place. So we were not hindered at that point. Everything was researched properly and uh, construction commenced quickly. People actually in Cairo love to go outdoors, especially at night, yeah, in summer. Yeah. People are uh, sitting in like boulevard medians or on bridges. They're looking, they're really looking for a spot of green space. Yeah. We hope it will attract a lot of birds. Uh, in Cairo now, when I was young, we, I used to see maybe 10, 20, 30 species of birds, but now a child cannot see even a single bird in Cairo. Is it? a green space on top of a, a garbage dump, it seemed like a mission impossible. It represented a titanic work because in one hand, many cubic meters of uh, saline soil had to be removed and replaced by earth brought from elsewhere, a fertile earth, that uh, will provide uh, the adequate uh, soil for the plantations that were to transform this space into a green space. Something like 80,000 uh, truckloads of uh, debris left the park. Um, we're looking really forward. We're dreaming about the day that the park would open. I mean, we hope that uh, it would be enjoyable. I mean, we want people to come in the morning and uh, walk around, uh, come in large number of families and have fun and so forth. So. I would like to uh, simply say what a, a unique opportunity it is to uh, develop a park of this nature uh, in the heart of historic Cairo, uh, to create a park which will, uh, inshallah, bring well-being, not only in terms of the environmental context, but also in the social context. And uh, it is uh, probably going to be uh, one of the most unique parks because uh, I am not aware of any other cities um, that have this opportunity. So we 
took the essence or the criteria that was used in Islamic gardens yeah. uh, in terms of quality and detail and use of indigenous plants and indigenous trees and enjoyment and uh, the very careful and uh, intelligent use of water, uh, the use of uh, aromatic plants, uh, the containment of space, the intricate use of pattern and so forth. Uh, this we hope uh, will uh, reflect on the people on terms of uh, the perception and conception of people of what is a park or what should a park be. The process of building this park also started by creating a nursery in the vicinity of Cairo. And uh, for several years, this uh, piece of land grew some of the most uh, slower growing plants in the park. For example, the royal palm trees that today constitute the main alley of, uh, of the park. The next step was to keep the topography, the new shape of the mountain intact. And then it started to rain and the slopes are starting to disappear. And then to find ways and means to fix that. That was our most immediate and pressing problem. We didn't know how to fix the slopes. And we started doing the wrong thing, is to put in irrigation. It was even worse. And then finally this was resolved by a number of measures, building a, 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 a wall in the bottom and uh, finding uh, the right type of plants to fix the soil. We had a brilliant uh, doctor called Dr. Badawi, and he's an expert who came in, and uh, he tried, he tried various species of plantations to go in, in various areas of the park. So I, I would give the, the whole credit to this person. Was it difficult to decide what plants to use? Difficult? Mm -hmm. I would like that we deal with, with all plants. Well, we have no problems with the plants. Because this is my, uh, our specification, specialization, how to propagate, how to deal, how to protect, how to maintain such plants, which is very important to deal with uh, these plants. Difficult, uh, if you find it difficult, we have to search for a solution for these difficulties and to solve this problem. Yeah. Many people came and said, it's impossible to be so. The analysis showed me uh, unbelievable values of salinity, higher than the uh, Red Sea water and concentration of salts, which is very huge. I thought, no, we have to, I have a very good team, people working with me day and night, how to make it possible. How can we do a park near a very poor district which would not become alien yet? You don't feel like uh, I'm here and the rich park for the people, the park for the rich people is there yet. People are very suspicious at the beginning of somebody giving a gift, and they always have this, you know, in the back of their heads, why is somebody giving us a gift? I mean, there is no gift without, without something in return, so what's behind the park? So the idea of involving the people of Darb al Ahmar uh, was very important, yeah. There was major skepticism. All they see, they cannot build, they cannot take a permit, 
they are going to be removed. That's all they know since the 70s from official papers in the district. And so to tell them that there is this uh, project that is willing to put money to repair your home on condition that you also participate was something uh, unbelievable to them. There are about 200,000 people who live in Daldalba Alman and therefore uh, um, in the major investment in the park uh, needs to be able to have a ripple effect on the demography around the park and therefore you have to build that into the overall program. And so we're working in housing rehabilitation, we're working in microcredit, we're working in education and healthcare, we're working in upgrading local NGOs. So uh, the important thing is to enable the community in Dalba Ahmad to benefit from the long-term uh, return on the park. This room was uh, including two beds and uh, a kitchen. Uh, now it couldn't have any <laughs> anything until bedroom and the kitchen like a uh, <laughs> So one of your rooms has got smaller, but you have got... This is the game. <laughs> this is the game. <laughs> two two beds or one bathroom. <laughs> when the, the questionnaire started and they visited the, the homes, um, Dr. Adina Shuhaib, the one who led this uh, process, informed us uh, exactly what's happening, what is the project aim to do in El Darb al -Ahma. There was a resistance from the neighbors. We didn't feel comfortable until we met someone with a kind face, approachable, uh, like Dr. Adina. I exactly remember the time when Dr. Adina came, because I used to argue with her against the objectives of the project, saying that this is not um, realistic to, uh, to do this in al Darb al-Ahmar, and there is other need. He, he, the project didn't uh, consider it, and, and actually she used to collect all this information and analyze it with the people in charge. This was a new start in El Darb al-Ahmar for us, and we hoped with her. We felt like she provided us, like there is something new will happen. It was a continuous like effort to try to convince everybody around it. This was a very hectic process, but it was also like very fulfilling because you feel that you're doing something completely different. You're implementing something on the ground, you're making a difference in people's lives, and you can it, it just rewards you immediately because once people go back to their houses and you see the change, the amount of investment that they're doing in these houses, it was something that even a personal level like a very fulfilling process. While uh, the grading of the park was taking place along roughly 1.1 kilometers uh, on the edge of the park, this great monument started coming out of the ground, which is the Ayyubid Wall. What a revelation. It is considered one of the most important uh, Islamic findings in the 20th century. Now, what do we do with this uh, magnificent structure that has been sitting under the debris and rubble uh, for over 500 years?
what's Maybe. that thing there? Nora, that you're... Nora? Uh, this, I think, it's a Ubud masonry. Maybe for the gate. What? Yeah, that's basically all of it. So, I mean, the gate should be coming through between the two towers, and then, you know, according to the indications that exist now, turning and going off through here. So this would be the, the basic side of the gateway as you come through. These are the coins we found. I clean, this is my cleaning device here. Um, you, put, you just put a stainless steel object and then you put the coin on the other side and you connect them with electricity with water and some salt. And then uh, and it cleans up the coin. And the results aren't that great. Like this one, uh, supposedly Mamluk, but um, it's been quoted a lot, so you can't really see, um, see much. So can you sort of describe briefly what this area is? What, this? what, you, what you were looking at here is, is a series of 18th and 19th century buildings which have been built over the gate, over the, the foundations of the gate. Uh, and the, the two towers on either side, obviously marking the position of where it once was. Uh, at the moment, work is going on to investigate how much of the gate remains and also the possibility of incorporating it and reusing it as, as an entrance from the park to Double Apple. We were amazed also because we found the internal spaces of the wall in these round towers, probably built by uh, Christians, uh, prisoners by Salah uh, because the architecture is exactly the same as the military architecture in Europe of the same time. We found these enormous spaces uh, in the round towers where nobody had been before for several hundred years uh, since they've been filled with earth. The ceiling here is uh, some... Uh... Oh, yeah, it's... Yeah. Oh, you look at that. And it goes on like this. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Did you see it behind me? You know, it's much more dramatic than anybody could describe in writing. You, know, you actually have to see this. The second surprise was that we found, with uh, the collaboration of the French Archaeological Institute of Oriental Archaeology, we find also the remains of the Fatimid wall built in, in adobe. And this was a, a total surprise because there were no traces of that in the, in the scientific literature until then. The issue was, was how much of it would be excavated. I mean, clearly it makes a big difference excavating one metre and excavating ten metres in terms of not just that work, but all of the conservation work, future planning, you know, how, it, you know, you, you've, you've got whatever, you're, whatever level you excavate to, and the same, the same is true in here. Once the excavation's over, you've either got a choice of backfilling, raising the level again, or committing to quite a long period of maintenance and, and conservation. The discovery of the walls, the restoration and the construction of the archaeological promenade uh, represented a number of millions of dollars that were not uh, forecasted or uh, foreseen in the initial budget plans. So one thing after the other, uh, we had to be creative on how to use the wall, how to integrate it into the landscape, and how to integrate it into the rest of the monuments in, uh, in Darb al -Ahmar. The residents of Darb al Ahmar did not appreciate the monuments that are all around them because there are laws that uh, actually require their eviction from their houses because they are within uh, 10 meters of a monument. And most of them were, there, were either abutting a monument or within that proximity. We 
we told them that we would work with the authorities and we would help them, and, and that's what we did. We were able uh, to convince the authorities that these laws were for uh, pharaonic monuments, but not for uh, Islamic monuments where the residents have already built and live integrated within these monuments. At that point, once they realized that their tenure was secured, they started appreciating these monuments and seeing that these monuments now could become a way for them to gain a better living because tourists and Egyptians would come into Darb al -Ahmar. They would buy their products, they would, uh, they would be able to trade, they would be able, their workshops would be able to sell directly to them. So a different feeling altogether uh, started to take place. بدات حياتي مع والدي وبدراستي خلصت دراسه واشتغلت مع والدي الدنيا اتلخبطت شويه في حال البلد والدنيا بقت في الشغل قل فعرفت ان في مشروع اسمه مشروع تنميه الدرب الاحمر تبع المؤسسه الاغخان فلقيت ناس كتير بتروح فقلت انا اروح اجرب انا عايز اشتغل فاضطريت فعلا ان انا اروح اشتغل معاهم وبصراحه لقيت ان موضوع تجديد الحي بتاعنا اصلا اللي انا مولود فيه لقيت البيوت بتاعتنا الصوره الاصليه اللي كانت بقى لها زمن مثلا 60 70 سنه قديمه بيطلعها لي زي ما هي بيقول لي نفذها فانا اشتغلت في المشروع بحب اصلا يعني انا يعني انا حبيت الموضوع ان لقيت المنطقه بتاعتي هتحافظ على على جيراني وعليا انا نفسي في موجود في نفس المكان فحبيت الموضوع واضطريت ان انا اشتغل معاهم وفي نفس الوقت مع شغلي مع الجماعه مع الناس دول بصراحه كان يعني استفدت كتير منهم One of the advantages of the project is that we were based in the neighborhood. We were not coming from the outside. We were spending eight hours a day in this neighborhood together with the people over there. This alley is part of another layer of history. You cannot say that the Ayyubid wall was the only history of the area, but also these houses, they belong to the history of the area. It's an accumulation of different layers of history that you cannot ignore. But the situation is going to be that with the existence of such a park, they're going to be like a huge process of gentrification, first because of the road, second because of the... Such a road will allow high-rise buildings to come up and watch the park, you know, which means that another row of houses is going to be demolished because people want to talk to watch the park from this area. And people whose money was influenced, they're going to come and just buy this row of houses again. So what we presented to the antiquities is an alternative way of uh, development that could happen here in this area, which is more sustainable, relying on the resources of the original community that lived here. So it's not only we're talking about physical structures, we're not talking about money, we're talking about people. <laughs> We restored more than a hundred houses in this neighborhood and none of them was like similar to, to the other. You had to deal with the authorities because to them this was completely unorthodox. A lot of uh, historic areas are gentrified and renovated, but never with the money of tenants. This was new.
We did some cost estimates that were based that they're going to contribute some part of the money. We were lucky to have a, a microcredit program on our side because this microcredit program enabled us to make it much easier for people to pay back for the restoration cost. The money they put in restoring their homes is very important for the sustainability of the repair. When you go and do something for free for someone, they might not value it so much. But when they invest in it, there is ownership. How does it feel for you to be involved in a project like this? I mean, it must be quite exciting because it's a, a big thing, isn't it? Yeah, no, it is very exciting because uh, you, know, you learn a lot and it's you're dealing with like a lot of different things. I mean, I'm not just dealing with archaeology, but a lot with like uh, the social side of it, and uh, you know, with the Darbal Ahmed residents and things like that. So it's. Uh, it's a very integrated project, I think, so. This program helped many people to, uh, to uh, work, to find work, to improve their work, to give you a credit program, to working with you, to training, to hire you in other right. places. Mm. Uh, so he find it is very uh, important to program here. You know, this district specifically has been famous historically for marble work and stonework. And that dimension is, is used here. There are a lot of uh, masons that are very skilled. There are a lot of uh, carpenters also that do the fine woodwork. Uh, there's the young people also who can be trained. So that dimension of, of blending historically and blending socially was very important. This is a good example of uh, um, what we try to do, is to revitalize traditional stone cutting uh, techniques by restoring monuments. So it's not only improving the physical condition of the monuments, but making sure that the techniques to restore it are still available. Our group here, we have the males and females, the fresh graduate, uh, experienced people, Christian, Muslim, they are working together to uh, preserve one of the magnificent buildings of their heritage. This is the uh, most exciting thing is the restoration field. Uh, you start to restore, you start to remove a layer uh, of the dust to discover the layer of history, and then you remove the next layer of the dust to discover the next layer of history. This many say uh, the work here very difficult, but we can make this work. <laughs> yeah. The great thing in Darbel Ahma was the, the construction of the school as a community center, and then the restoration of the square, the Al Aslam. We installed also some some uh, children's uh, playground there, and we removed a very old cafe and allowed the owner to to occupy a new cafe we built for him. So that was a revitalization of the. Uh, community life by uh, and, and promoting the relationships as, as you know here in Cairo the people relate to themselves in the street this is a very much of a city of street life what was really phenomenal by that time which actually contributed to the project later on is that 
how their neighbors came into the new houses to visit them and see what the quality of these restored houses and, and how they look like from the inside. And this was the greatest word of mouth and actually a, a promotion tool for the program because people saw that it's not only about like a facelifting of these houses, it's really changing the houses from the inside. It really changes the lives of the people living there. In Dar al Ahmar, as in many other historic cities around the world, individual and significant monuments are a great asset, not uh, just for the present generation, for future generations. And um, uh, Dar al Ahmar, this area of Cairo, is, uh, compares uh, with Florence or Rome or one of the greatest and most densely historical cities in Europe, is the equivalent in the Muslim world. Currently, and since 95, uh, even UNESCO uh, is acknowledging intangible heritage. So it's not just monuments. It's also the people, the activities, the heritage activities, and who conducts them. And Darb al Ahmar is a place where most of the residents are either producing craftsmen or merchants in traditional crafts and traditional uh, vocations. Nobody believed in the beginning that this, this, this neighborhood can change. Nobody believed that people was like 70% of the neighborhood living under the poverty line would invest, especially tenants, into restoring these houses with big amounts of money. So this was actually turning the heads of many people to see that it's possible. You know, it's possible if you put together the right ingredients to achieve such kind of continuous rehabilitation process. Madam Mubarak, Excellencies, honored guests, ladies and gentlemen. 21 years ago, we had a vision that launched us on a journey of inquiry, exploration, and discovery. The path we followed has led us finally to this evening at the inauguration of this magnificent park with so many who have contributed to this historic achievement. Many projects continue, and there are no doubt many surprises to come and many lessons to be learned. I constantly have been reminded that we were touching the very foundations of my ancestors, the Fatimids. 35 generations later, through the work done here by my institutions, it is my prayer that this park will be a continuing contribution to the people of this great city. Thank you. Thank you. 
in the most congested days, which are holidays and peaks, visitors would reach 40,000 in one day. We would end, alhamdulillah, free of any incidents due our, to our efforts and services provided to our visitors. I, I wish we could do more, but we're doing everything we can to please our guests and to please our visitors. And I think we're doing a good job. People are happy. People are very happy with the park. The government considers this the benchmark of all parks. Whenever they write a story in the newspaper and they say, we're going to build a new park better than Lazar Park. Azhar Basque on the top now, the top of the parks. And now when I come, I was very happy to see what, what we did. And until this program stopped in 2009, there were applications. Until 2012, I'm walking the streets here some 14 years later, people stop me and say, is the housing program still running? Can we still join? I have an old house and I want to renovate it. It is a project that not just challenges technical, but also it impacts humans. It impacted lots of families and uh, it makes one very proud because the ability to show the heritage of this country in the way it, it should be shown. Heritage is not transferred in history books only. Heritage is also lived. Historic Cairo is living heritage. It's not fake. It's not a museum. Giving attention and, and value to the professions, to the lifestyle, to the families of craftsmen, to the buildings that they built and designed themselves gives them dignity and, and gives them a message that they are of value. Knowing who we are, appreciating where we come from and who we are is, is very important.